This morning I am reading from Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians, chapter 2, verses 1 through 8. This is from the King James Version. For you yourselves know, brethren, that our coming to you was not in vain, but even after we had suffered before and were spitefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much conflict. For our exhortation did not come from error or uncleanness, nor was it in deceit. But as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who tests our hearts. For neither at any time did we use flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak for covetousness, God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from men, either from you or from others, when we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, just as nursing, a nursing mother cherishes her own children. So affectionately longing for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you had become dear to us. This is God's word for God's people. Thank you, Dan. So how was your week? Some good, some bad, some up, some down. Maybe you're in between. You're like, eh, I don't know. It wasn't really great. It wasn't really bad. It was wet. It was cold. But then hot. But then cold. <laughs> kind of like, Kind of like our lives at times, right? Even our spiritual lives. Whatever it is that you had to face this week, I hope that you found some hope in being rooted in Scripture. I can't say that enough, that that is a source of strength. It is a source of hope, it is a source of direction, and it is a source of strength, especially when you don't have any. It's what then forces us into growing and, and becoming something else, and then when we grow, we begin to spread that message of how Jesus changed our lives. That's been the crux of our year, right? No matter what happens around us or in the, the, the grand world around us, our lives are rooted. We're fixed. We're, we're set. That, that stuff around us can't hurt us, change us. Think of that mighty big oak tree that stands tall in the fiercest storms and never never wavers that's because of the roots that's because of the growth and strength that he's built over the years right that's us we've been talking about living in the light now for pretty much all of october we started out talking about ourselves how we need to live in the light what does it look like when we're living in the light right we look different People say we look different when we then changed our focus to then now how as a church do we live in the light? How is our church perceived? How do we look to the world? What happens when we do this out there? Last week we talked about how it should look. And today Paul gives us a little bit of a different take and, and we were in 1 Thessalonians last week, and now in chapter 2, we see that his, his, kinda, his, his message is a little different, right? It turns more into a, I don't know, for those of you that, that have been on an Emmaus weekend, it turns more into a perseverance talk, right? It turns into a, I, I can do this, but I'm going to have to withstand some things if I, ha- if I can do this. Now, in today's text from the lectionary, we can take this text, we can break it down into three main areas of what he's talking about. In that first part, in verses one through three, we find out what it means to be in ministry. 
Now, I know that all of you are staring at me and you're like, whoa, that's your job. (laughs) Unfortunately, no. I've said this before, and I know people say I'm crazy, but uh, I'm I'm called to, to this ministry. But there are so many more ministries that you are all called to. This set-apart pastor ministry is just something I was silly enough to say yes to. But we're all called to be priests, to be ministers to everyone around us all the time. Whether you are called to be a pastor, maybe some of you are struggling with that, I don't know. But even if you're just volunteering in ministry, a certain ministry that you feel you're called to that that is guiding you and that you feel hopeful about, whatever it is that you are a part of, you're going to face opposition. Now that opposition is not always, it's not always what you think. It's not always a flood and you're a great ark builder, right? It's not always a giant and you're really good with a slingshot. Sometimes you're the guy with the slingshot, but there's a flood coming, right? Sometimes you, and I'm thinking about David, the king, you are sometimes your own worst enemy. Whatever it is, we are going to face opposition to the declaration of this good news. We were in, had, I had a great class time yesterday. We were, uh, we've been uh, studying all the Gospels over the last three weeks, and yesterday we really focused in on the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John is really kind of different than the other three. Matthew and Luke, they tend to come from Mark, but John is just this other, other thing in itself, and it tells such a different story, and the way it tells it, there's more spirit, there's more uh, life engaged in, in John. And so, as we were talking about this, the the subject came up of the Samaritan woman at the well. Now, Jesus is God. At least that's what we say we believe, right? The Son of God, fully God, fully human, fully divine, can do anything he wants. I mean, he raised Lazarus from the dead, right? This is the guy that you would think would be successful in ministry, right? Right? But was he? I mean, there's even a a time that we can read in Scripture where the, the, the Pharisees really disagreed with him. They thought, I mean, here's this guy claiming he's the Son of God. They tried to stone him. He slipped away because it wasn't time. But he goes to this woman at the well, and this Samaritan woman, he's not even supposed to be talking to her. You don't associate with Samaritans. Uh Uh-uh, not in this culture, let alone a woman who's a Samaritan, who's obviously coming to the well in the middle of the day because she's got things in her past that she doesn't want anyone to really pay attention to. Jesus never once is focused on the outcome. Never once in this relationship is he focused on the, man, she's gonna gonna kneel right here and, and pray to me and accept me as her savior. That's what's going to happen right now today. And if it doesn't, oh, crud. No, Jesus is not about the outcome. He's about the good news. He's about the message. He is about sharing his life with her. And that's what changes everything. That's what causes her to leave and talk about this guy who talked to me at the well. I remember, um, I'm sure, how many of you have volunteered for something at the church? A sale, uh, a, a, a dinner, um, a funeral thing, um, a cleanup. Uh, we just talked about hanging to the greens here coming up, right? How many times have you volunteered for something and you've thought to yourself when you got there, what am I doing here? I, I, I'm not any good at this. I'm miserable at this. Maybe you've been called to like lead a Sunday school class and, and you had a, a few kids for a while and then some of them, suddenly nobody shows up anymore. Right? You feel defeated. You feel like, oh man, I'm a failure. I'm horrible at this. I'm not any good at this. God, why did you call me to this? Or did you call me to this? 
And so we're, we're defeated because we're focused on the outcome. I remember uh, is in the 90s, uh, maybe late 90s, uh, I was a youth leader at, at Grace United Methodist in Piqua, and every year we would have this youth trip to Ichthus. Now, Ichthus was a, a whole weekend, uh, like a, imagine a, a, a Christian, uh, Christian Woodstock, right? Camping, outdoors, um, three days of, of, you know, band after band after band after band. You know, every night you'd have the big, the big hit guy, you know, Michael W. Smith or, or Stephen Curtis Chapman. Back in the see, that's just showing how old I am. And so you'd always get like 100 kids would sign up for this thing. Why not? It's so much fun. You get to go camping. You get to hang out with your friends. You get to run around and see other young people that are your age that are, you know, you get to find music that you like that's not Stephen Curtis Chapman or Michael W. Smith. And so it was such a fun time. Now, every other youth group night, we might have, what, 10, 15 kids maybe. (laughs) But then that event, that event, man, that brought them in. No, no, a lot of them didn't stay. A lot of them were never changed. But if we would have just focused our thoughts and our minds on, wow, we only got like 10 to 15 kids every week. This isn't really working. What are we doing? I'm assuming also that if there wasn't like a paid youth pastor at that church, it probably would have died long before that, right? But we were not focused on the outcome. We were focused on sharing our lives. We were focused on being a part of a community of people that cared. Paul says in in today's text, he says, Yet our God gave us the courage to declare his good news to you boldly in spite of great opposition. So you can see that we were not preaching with any deceit or impure motives or trickery. When we make it about ourselves and we make it about the, in, the outcome for us, we tend to change the way the message comes out. When we are trying our best to be honest, to be true, to be authentic in relationship with other people, it comes from in here, it comes from our heart, and it becomes something different. God has entrusted us to be messengers of this good news. He's entrusted us in uh, in the care of and in the distribution of the greatest news in the history of the world. Jesus, a risen Savior, has saved us. This now, he has since risen and ascended then to heaven, so that the Holy Spirit would come and be with us. How often do we take that for granted? That we might have Holy Spirit power within us that we can actually overcome opposition, even sometimes when it's ourselves. This Holy Spirit that's with us begins to examine us and examine our hearts, and and it helps us to realize whether or not we are looking for flattery or whether or not we are looking for for being fake just to win people over. And Dan, I appreciate you standing and saying thank you so much. It's Pastor Appreciation Month. And I can say, maybe I don't speak for every pastor out there, but I speak for this pastor and I say, this is my job. I really hope that you are blessed and I hope that you are filled and I hope that you are experiencing Christ because that is what God has called me to. And if I'm not doing that for you, then maybe there's an examination of what my motives are. I can tell you right now, my motivation is not so that we can put a different higher number every week on that board back there. I don't care who's here. I mean, I care who's here, obviously. (laughs) But my job is to listen. 
My job is to bring the presence of God, to bring an, an exposition of the word of God so that you can feel it, you can hear it, you can be moved by it, and then you, for the other six days of this week, will be the church in the world. That is what this is. The gospel is the good news. It speaks for itself. It does not need embellishment. It does not need me to, to have an ichthus every Sunday so we can draw hundreds of people in. It doesn't need that. It doesn't even need me. <laughs> it will get to you one way or the other. Paul says in today's text, he says, we should, quote, not be pretend, not pretending to be your friends just to get your money. <clears throat> As for human praise, we have never sought it from you or anyone. Human praise is a crazy kind of drug, let me tell you. Human praise can get you to do things that you really wouldn't want to do normally. It might change the way you interact with people in certain situations. It might change the person that you become because you want and crave that attention and that, 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 that reciprocation of whatever it is that you're getting. And Paul says, this good news of the gospel, it's not about that. It's not about that at all. How many of you have ever heard me uh, stand here and say, well, you've got to invite people next week because we need to fill more people in here. How many of you have heard me say, hey, get your checkbook out, man. Our bank account's getting slow, getting slim, getting skinny. We need money. Come on, get your checkbook out. It's not about that. If I am encouraging you to engage in this life, am I encouraging you to get and build and grow this relationship that you have with God through Jesus, these things will come. These things will happen. But again, it's up to us. One of the things that we miss, and, and again, I, I, I implore you that you are all ministers, some way, some shape, or form, you have interactions with human beings on a daily basis. Now they're probably a little bit different than they used to be. <laughs> Some of you are on a lot of Zoom calls, right? Some of you are on the phone a lot more. But it looks different. But you're still interacting. There are still family members that are close. There are still coworkers that you have to interact with and are close. There are still people in your life that are close. And one of the things that we miss in ministry is the payback. We are taught from a very, very, very young age that if you do A, you'll receive B. Kindergarten, preschool, right? Get this assignment done, do the math, do the science, do the whatever, and you're going to get an A. Hey, if you come home from school and you get your chores done, you're going to get allowance. Hey, now that you're older, you can have an actual job in the real world, and so you're going to show up and you're going to work so many hours and you're going to get paid. In our condition, the way we've conditioned ourselves is that when we do A, we get B. The problem with ministry is when we do A, sometimes we don't get B. Sometimes we get F. And therefore, we stop doing A. And Jesus is trying to tell us today through Paul, that's not what this is about. This is about a life lived. This is about an eternity that goes beyond a payback for your A. This goes beyond something that, that's not natural for us. I mean, we plant crops in the ground. Where's my farmers at? We plant crops in the ground. Uh, uh, there's watering that's done by God. There is care that we can take. 
for them while they're growing, and eventually comes the harvest, right? Now imagine if you spent your time planting, helping, nurturing, growing, and when it comes to harvest, there's nothing there. Boy, that'd be, that'd be devastating. But that's what it's like when we are in ministry because the world doesn't really want to hear this message. They don't. They want to live in their world. They want to live in their box. They want to live where things are. And you know what? It's okay. You are. And I are not responsible for changing the hearts of men and women. That's up to God. That's his job. That's what he does. We oftentimes, though, we miss our payback. And we stop. We stop the message. We stop the good news. I am not always as good as Dan laid out this morning. There's things that I forget. There's things that I miss. I, I'm, I'm active in a lot of things. I have class every semester. I've, you know, I've got two churches. I have you know, a, a lot of people that, that it's, hard to, it's hard to reach and touch and, and be a part of everyone all the time, especially two active kids. One now's a senior. This is going to be a horrible end of this year. <laughs> Talk about a payback. <laughs> Where's that going? And I drop the ball a lot. And I know that I put way too much pressure on myself. <laughs> I see myself much differently than probably you see me. But I put a lot of pressure on myself. And because I don't want you to miss the payback that you, that you should see. But you miss it sometimes because I'm not always where you expect me to be or I should be. And for that, I'm truly sorry. And I know that you guys feel that way too about things in your life and things that you're doing though. There's things that you're in charge of, things that you're a part of, and, and you just, man, I just don't have the time right now. I've just let this slip. I just can't. Man, I really wanted to send so-and-so a card and I totally forgot, right? There's things where we do that and, and it's because we're focused on the payback. We can make it more simple. Paul uses the illustration, and I don't know if everybody's going to get the illustration, but I know moms, you're going to get the illustration. It's like a mother feeding and caring for her own children. It's a natural thing, right? You wouldn't not think of taking care of your kids. Maybe most of you. <laughs> but we do. We can begin to show God and his light in the world around us a little easier if we just love the way Paul is telling us to love each other. He, he closes out this section of the text and he says, we loved you so much that we shared not only God's good news, but we shared with you our lives. My, my neighbor is uh, really good with things and sometimes I'm not. And so our, our hot water heater was, it's, it's a tankless water heater and it, it does its thing, and you know, man, every once in a while, for the longest time there, it was just, pfft, it would go on and off, on and off. And you'd have to go back and reset it, go all the way down to the basement, reset it, you know, do it over and over and over again until it would finally work. And so I was finally talking to him about that, and he's like, oh, that's easy. It's like there's a little, there's a little plug in the bottom, you just take it out, and you got to you gotta, it's got gunk in it because it's got like a filter, so you just got to get the gunk out of it and then it'll be just fine. And I'm like, really? And so I thought, well, I'm not going to, I don't, I don't want to put him out. I don't want to, I'll try it myself. I have no idea what I'm looking for or where it's at. But I'm going to try to find this filter and I'm going to try to fix it myself. I did a lot of things to that thing and it never worked. And so I finally said, hey, what, what are you talking about? I was like, I've got to run to a meeting, but I know Jill's here. Mom and dad are here. Swing by if you get a chance and, and show them what you were trying to tell me because I, I can't figure it out. He literally shows up at the house. He walks downstairs. There's a cap underneath, which I wasn't expecting. 
and he just unscrews it, and all this gunk comes out. He's, and he screws it back in, and there it goes. It's like, yeah, you just need to do that about once a year. And I'm like, it's probably never been done, like ever. I wouldn't imagine. I mean, we've been there four years. It hasn't been done because nobody ever said, hey, you should do that once a year. And so here is my neighbor sharing his life with me and making a difference. And for what? Never really got a payback. But that's what we're called to be like to the world. Sharing our lives. When we are covered in prayer and study, we have a better ear to where God is trying to lead us, and it's so much easier to be light in the world. It's so much easier to follow that leading and follow that prompting when we know where it's coming from. When it becomes more living, more second nature, than intentionally focused on the outcome, then we have a better opportunity to show people this authentic God that he is. We have a better chance to love God and love people, which is, in a sense, what Jesus wants us to do. Making it simple, right? We loved so much that we shared not only the gospel, but we shared with you our lives. How can we shine the light of Christ in our community? How can we be a part of lives Not so that they'll become Jesus converts. Not so that they'll come in and be a number on a board. Not so that they'll come in and put money in a plate. No. So that our life can be shared with other lives and we can all benefit from being together and being community. You've heard me say it before that, man, our country sure missed the mark. Instead of, you know, funding, you know, more and more welfare programs we should have actually funded an accurate church an accurate christian church because what they were doing in the first century was they were building community because they had to these followers of jesus had the right mindset they loved each other they shared everything no one was hungry no one was without a place to lay their head no one was out in the cold Because they loved each other and shared their lives with each other. Can you imagine what our country would look like if the church would just be the church? How can we do that in our community? Leadership? Maybe. Planning? Maybe. Programs? Maybe. Events? Concerts? Right? Movie nights, maybe we tried that too, right? Those things are good and those things have their place. However, if you're not sharing your life with someone else, it's going to come across as, oh boy, here goes those church people again. Right? How many of you interact with somebody on a daily basis? You're super nice to them. You've maybe thought about asking them to come to church, but man, that's going to come across really corny and stupid, right? But maybe if our church, if our light was shining in such a welcome, warm way that we want you to be a part of this family, because in this family, we take care of each other. How many of you can raise your hand and say, that's true? In this family, we love and take care of each other. We want you to be a part of that. We want you to be experience this, not because we want something from you, not because we want you to, to, to pay us back for this, but because we want you to receive what we receive. The thing that separated the early church from ours is true community. They were the light to each other because if not, they would die, literally. Literally. I pray that we as a church are becoming that church. 
that we as a group of people who believe in Jesus are becoming those people. And I hope that you see that and want to be a part of that too. Because that's living in the light. Amen.